We are back. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on this Friday edition of the Flow Track Podcast. I am Kevin Sully. He is Gordon Mack. Subscribe to the Flow Track Podcast YouTube page if you haven't yet. Become a member and email the show, flowtrackpodcast at gmail.com. Gordon, good morning. This is our third show before Worlds. Is that right? Yeah. Monday, Wednesday, and that's it after this. Well, actually, it's our 482nd show before Worlds. Good point if you want to turn the clock back. But then, as I said, we had other Worlds, but we didn't. This podcast has never covered a World Championship, only an Olympics. Exactly. That's right. That's right. started in 2020. All right. Anyway, well, how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing good. I'm excited. It's Friday. Um, making, you know, this summer has gone by really fast. It's like, it's already... Call it mid July. Fourth of July feels like a, a year ago. I was mm. also thinking about this. Worlds is in a week, right? Yep. Worlds is going to be over, and there's still going to be a few days left in July. Is this one of the yeah, most early, most earliest years for World Championships in recent memory? Yeah, it's really early because then if you look yeah. at the whole calendar and you go post World Championships, there's Five, four diamond leagues left. Yeah. No, five diamond have, leagues left. Including Monaco. World- Monaco hasn't happened yet. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then continental it's- or Commonwealth Games, European Championships, all that stuff. There's going to be... Thinking about, it's going to be weird. Right? You know what there's going to be? You know what there's going to be a lot of time for? What? Redemption. You're going to be hearing about redemption a lot. Oh, they lost world championships, but they did the Commonwealth Euro double, or they won the Diamond League final in Monaco. Some people are going to completely end their season in Eugene, and that's going to be it. And some people, it's just going to be a jumping off point for the rest of the season. It's going to be very strange. Yeah, I was thinking it's going to be strange in other ways too, like how motivated will some athletes be who are coming off of yeah. like winning worlds? Like they're going to win worlds and then be like, all right. Now I don't. I can shut it down, and I don't need to win anything anymore. I'm kind of worried about will there be like drama or competition or just like races that yeah. matter. Like when we watch eventual like a end of August, early September race, winning or losing, at the end of the day, we'll be like, well, the guy who got fourth is the world champion, so who cares? He wasn't trying, yeah, because he won worlds. A month ago mm-hmm. it's gonna be weird yeah. well let's look at last year let's just take men's 1500 for example Jakob finally beats chariot wins olympic gold goes to pre beats chariot but then chariot gets him in the diamond league final and that's it you had two races post olympics you can kind of say this about the women's 100 too there was a nice little postscript post the olympics this is going to be a whole nother chapter or chapters post world championships. It's not just going to be one race or two races. It's going to go on for a little bit. Now, some people might just run the one and and then shut it down. But if you're planning on running the diamond league final, that's September 7th and 8th in Zurich, September. So your, your season, if you're the, say the hundred meter champion, men's hundred meter champion, that's July 16th. Women's hundred meter champion. That's July 17th. And then the Diamond League final isn't until the beginning of September. Two months later. I have no idea yeah. how that's going to go. I have no idea how much people are going to emphasize that or care about that. Again, the people who don't do well are going to be motivated. People who go out early, or the people who have already been knocked out, a lot of American athletes who didn't make the team, there's a source yeah. of motivation there. But yeah, how, how pumped is Shelly Ann Fraser Price going to be? on September 7th, right? That mid-distance group on the men's and women's side. How excited are they going to be on August 10th in Monaco for fast times? I think Monaco, and we'll obviously have plenty of time to talk about this later, I think it might help Monaco just in terms of a pursuit of records because I think you just see a lot of people take huge swings, say we're going for the world record, and if it doesn't work out, who cares? Because we've already had the most important part of our season. But then you have Europeans in there, which a lot of athletes care about. And you have Commonwealth there, which a lot of athletes care about. So 
there's championships sprinkled in there as well too but it kind of even the championships being early makes the season longer in a way yeah my main thing is we're going to want to talk about who is the best runner of the year right yeah are are we going to have a lot of best runner of the years who did not win worlds or are we just gonna is it a prerequisite autumn, is, how much yeah yeah exactly how much it are we feels gonna like the world is gonna feel like that. oh that was the that was like a mid-season tournament race like it's yeah. not the true champion because oh you ran a random ra- you won a random race albeit the most important race mm. in july but you also were undefeated in the diamond league circuit and won yeah. won the commonwealth and european championships it's like okay were you really yeah. the number two runner in the world or are you actually number one and just had one bad race? So. Well, I think you're making an argument for the importance of rankings, someone to objectively look at it from a distance. So I guess I will take that responsibility on my shoulders, Gordon, and I will make sure to rank people throughout the rest of the summer. I'm not just going to stop after world championships. I think it obviously gets weighed the heaviest by a large amount but is it possible for someone to be the number one ranked runner at the end of the year who didn't win worlds i think so is it possible for that person to win athlete of the year i don't think so because i think there's going to be enough candidates of people who won worlds who went on to have good post seasons i'm more wondering who's going to run and for how long after this is over because that is very early but are like you're going to be a professional world champion runner and just gonna be like i'm done we need a, i, mean, I would be, what are we gonna do they're gonna not <laughs> you know what's run fun for like, vacations yeah they, they're gonna do nothing in august september october november december probably nothing january and they're gonna open up february 1st 2023 that seems ridiculous if that let's hold on let's dial it back it's a it's another championship here start a little later maybe april mid-april we'll tune up i think I think they'll run something because the season is so long, and especially if you're a gold medalist, people are going to want you. People are going to pay for you to be at their meet, but it's not going to be the same as before where, all right, I can squeeze another couple weeks out of this. I've already gone this far. You know what's interesting? It's like just the complete opposite of Doha the last time it was World Championships where everything was done before the World Championships. It was, com- remember, completely wrapped. Yeah. Diamond League berths were, wildcard berths were handed out for that and I, I honestly i think like you it. and i agreed at the time i like that better because the championship yeah. should be at the end of the season race. thought it was a bit weird to go from doha directly to madison wisconsin for a cross-country meet that was kind of strange or to Terre Haute, indiana that was a little weird or to be covering the chicago or was it no it was berlin it was berlin berlin, marathon, no, berlin yeah. and chicago both of them yeah michaela ran 201 41 when lincoln and i were in doha that was a little weird but in total, it felt good to have the whole season over before the World Championships because it's the culminating event. It should be at the end of the season, not in the middle of the season. Yeah. Okay, last question on this topic before we uh, go over some of the news that kind of broke right before the podcast perfectly. Thank you for break for news happening before 9 a.m. Yes. as opposed to after, especially on a Friday. Appreciate that. Yeah. Um, all right. Let's 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 take all the protect no the pro- the projected world champions are going to happen a week from now at all the track events mm-hmm. from the hundred to yeah. the ten k maybe from the hundred to the five k let's remove the ten k uh, no you can include the ten k because they're really five k runners too take all the champions what will be the average number of races that all the world champions mm. run post worlds track races. All right. I'm looking at the Diamond League schedule. Obviously, there's some continental tours in there as well, correct? Yep. There's some cha- champions, championships. Excuse me. Yep. I'm going to be bullish. I'm going to say 3.5. 3.5. That's where you send the over under at? Yeah. What do you think? I hope it's over that because that'll be great seeing them all at least four times. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you know what? 
I'm going to be optimistic. I'm not going to be pessimistic. I was going to be like set the over under at at like two. Well, yeah. And like be like, or 2.1 and be like, all right, they're only going to all run one to two races. But now that I think yeah. about it, you're going to have a lot of swag after winning a title. You're going to be like wanting to chase some appearance fees. You're going to do your comp. You're just, you're going to want to speed up as opposed to slow down. So we might actually see a lot more world champions racing than we think. So I'm willing to go with you. I think, yeah, 3.5, probably most people will run, run four times. Do you know what group I think would go under that though? Ooh, what group? Americans. So they're not yeah. running Euros. They're not yep. running Commonwealth. And the entirety of the schedule shifts to Europe. Now, everybody's going to run Monaco given the opportunity. You get invited to Monaco, I think you're going to show up. But yep. you, have, um, you have a Diamond League in Poland on August 6th. So that's the first one post-Worlds. Then you have Monaco, August 10th. Then Lausanne is August 26th, Brussels, September 2nd, and then Zurich, September 7th and 8th. That's a long time. time. Yeah, to go back and – I said four earlier, I guess it's five. That's a long time uh, to continue competing, especially if you're based in the States. Now, maybe you shut it down for a little bit. Maybe you skip those first two and then make a run at those final couple. Sure, I'll believe that. But in general, I think Americans are going to re- race less frequently because there's not going to be that pressure to compete for their country like there is for athletes in other uh, parts of the world. But cool. I also could see them, if Americans win a lot of gold, them getting a big payday to show up in Monaco and obviously wanting to show up in... I mean, you want to win the Diamond League final, right? I mean, yeah, you get a thing. buy. Right? right? Well, right. But, and here's, here's this a strategic thing, I guess, that could factor in. If you're in, a, in an event where your country gets the, wow, the world championship gold buy, then you know the Diamond League buy is off. So then that removes that incentive. But if you don't, so say, for example, men's high hurdles, Hansel Parchment gets the win in Eugene. If I'm a U.S. man, I'm making sure I'm doing my best to get there. Same thing in the, you know, the hundred, any any of these events, women's high hurdles, um, any of these stacked events, I'm making sure I'm trying to get that by. Because that's one thing we've learned, how valuable that is. Like Christian Coleman, that was incredibly valuable for him to have the buy. Lyles, it ultimately didn't matter, but I'm sure he appreciated having it. Same thing with Grant Holloway. And on and on and on and on. Nia Ali. Like, the buy is important. You, you want to avoid the, that pressure of having to be top three. And um, next year is going to be another real competitive meet trying to get there. It doesn't matter going, as much going to the Olympics and you're thinking about two years in advance. But in any event, all right. We're going to see somebody race tonight, Gordon, that we haven't seen race all year. I'm talking, of course, about Safan Hassan, scheduled to run a 5,000. In Portland, she won two golds in Tokyo, bronze in the 1500. I almost, this is crazy to say, I had assumed that she wasn't going to run this year just because we hadn't seen her. And she was on the pre-classic start list, and then she wasn't, and just hadn't heard anything from her. And I thought, all right, well, there must be something going on that we'll find out about later and that she's not going to be there. But she's running. She is running, and I think anytime Savannah Hassan is running, you take note, you pay attention. But at this late stage, and how good that women's mid-distance all the way up to distance field is right now, what do you see as Hassan's chances being for Eugene? I have no freaking clue. Like, it could be... Yeah, I, I probably should have been more prepared to have a take on Safan Hassan. I almost <laughs> wish, you know, we talk, I talked about how I wish news would break before the podcast. I wish you had run at least once before the podcast. 
before I can like have a take on what Safana Stam is going to do because she hasn't run at all. She didn't even run indoors, right? Correct. Yeah. So well, we haven't seen her the entire year of 2022. She's doing her own mm -hmm. version of uh, lockdown by locking down herself from not running on the track. But it's kind of funny, though, when you think about it, because there was a lot of commentary from my perspective about like, man, she must be tired after. Yeah, she looked tired. Like, yeah, doing the triple attempt. This is like, my goodness, Safan, you don't need to run for a whole nother year. That's probably what I said. And, and she said, I'm OK, like, she, she said, OK, <laughs> I'm not going to run for a whole nother year. I'm going to wait until the very last moment to to run and then compete at the world championships. Um, so, yeah, she's running in a 5K at the Portland uh, Stumptown Twilight. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see what she does. Trying to think. I think she's probably – she'll probably run, like, fine. Like, she'll run, like, whatever she needs to run. Mm -hmm. She's probably in shape to run at least 15 flat, right? She's probably not going to do anything crazy. Yeah. So she'll go out, just do, like, a – get my feet wet type race. The real question is, does she have the kick? Oh, yeah. Does she have the, like, the turnover that you're going to need to compete against the best in the final part of a 5K, the final part of a 10K? If, what, do you know what event she's in, entered in? Well, she's entered in all three. But, yeah, but she's not going to John, John did a write-up with quotes from her coach, and, yeah, they said they're not doing all three. Obviously. Did they say but which ones they're doing? I don't think – no. They said they haven't decided yet. But I don't think she's on the 1500. If you're trying to get a gold medal, you're not racing against Faith Kipiak on a 1500. I'm sorry. Yeah. It's just not – that's not a plan for success. But you got Nian Saba waiting in the, the longer stuff. You have Sagai. You have Gade. It's going to be hard no matter where you go. Yeah. So – I don't know that we're going to get anything out of this race other than, all right, she's healthy and at least going to show up. Because the, the 10K is basically a week away from this race. So she's not, even if she could run a fast time, she's not going to show it at this race. I think if she does perform well at Worlds, <laughs> that would just with no, with basically zero buildup. Because this is, this is almost, in a way, too close to the meet to count as a full effort. Does that make sense? I know that kind of sounds counterintuitive, but it's very clearly a let's just get your feet wet, as you mentioned. Let's go through the routine of racing again and just test your fitness a little bit. If this was three weeks ago, you'd say, all right, we can really judge something from this. But this is basically trying to get a little bit more intensity than you can have in a practice. So she's really going into world championships with, with nothing. Yeah. Except, obviously, being the greatest distance runner in the world right now. I don't know. I also thought about this. Do you think What's that you should have between... to at least do something to qualify for worlds? Obviously, she has all of her standards from the previous year, and the country's yeah. going to select her because they know she's, you know, amazing but do you think it's kind of weird that this is allowed one race you minimum like two race sit minimum? out the entire year and then to be like i'm here yeah this is not ideal i don't think this was the plan i know you mentioned her wanting rest after last year and it wasn't just the olympics remember post olympics she went after that mile record again she went after that fast 5k time at pre she ran against kip Yegon in the diamond league final in Zurich, she just kept going. She never stopped. Yeah. And by the end of the season, she looked completely gassed, which again, I don't blame her. I'm amazed that she, she got to the finish line. Yeah. But my question is, where does it become beneficial just at this point, not to race just to keep people guessing even more? No, you gotta do one. You just gotta do one where you're just like, all right, this is a race. Motion. Right. You're, you're putting yourself yeah. through, you know, a full 5,000 meters, a full 10,000, you know, because how often has she done like a full 
five K in training, you know, all of her workouts are probably broken down, whatever it is, her longer stuff is not at the pace that she's going to have to be running when it comes to race time. So it's a way to like, just get your legs to do a full race. So you kind of remember what that's like, because you might forget. Yeah. It's been a year, you know, right. I feel like I would forget. Would you forget race pace if you don't run a race for an entire year? I think she can mimic race pace in a workout just fine. I think it's all the other stuff that comes along with racing that you want to practice. The routine. All that stuff. Running with other people. But again, what's the rest of the field look like? This is not going to be the field that goes up against her in Eugene. I didn't... Yeah. I think... I think it's going to be tough. It's going to be tough to, if she runs the 10, defend that 10K title. Or if she runs the five, that's obviously going to be difficult because we've just seen how good everybody else is this year. And I don't think as good as these top, top athletes are in, in these events, the margin between being able to win gold and just not having it on that last lap or last two laps is, is quite quite small when it comes down to it, even though she wins by, uh, when she's at her best, she's able to win comfortably. I just think it's, it's very tough and very clearly this is, was not the plan going in. To, I know they wanted to take a lower, lower key type season, but no one's like, Hey, my first race is going to be a week before world championship starts. There's not a distance runner around that wants to do that, but we shall see. We shall we see. We shall see. All right. Anything else on that? No. Oh, I guess we'll find out. We'll make this decision after tonight. But, like, will you pick her to be a medalist in any event? Right now, doing this before we've seen this event, I would say no, which is crazy because she's clearly awesome. But I will wait until tonight. And maybe I'll say, man, she looks really comfortable running 1457. I think this this is it. I'm gonna pick her, but then I'll, they just released the full fields too. So you want to you want to dive into those and see, I mean we, we have a good idea based on each country announcing their team, but you can kind of do the math. And you're like, all right, well, if she's at her absolute worst, she's gonna get seventh, and then you start talking yourself into it. this. Really, wouldn't be that tough to get to get bronze if she's anywhere close to to what we've seen her before. I just it's just a huge jump up in competition right at the last minute. It reminds me of, was it Bekele in 2011? Let me look this up real quick before I move on. It just popped into my head. I feel as if he ran the, this was back when Kennedy Bekele was you know, on the track, still, still a, a threat. And I feel like he ran that Daegu 10,000 without running much that season. And then, yep, it was his only race. But then, two weeks later in Brussels, he ran 26.43 in a 10K, but he did nothing in 2010, showed up to Daegu. We're like, oh, is this it? Is, this, is he going to do it? And he DNF'd. And in 2010, he had barely raced as well, too. But you give these athletes the benefit of the doubt because it just – it feels as if success at a certain point is inevitable because they're so good. And I remember watching that race thinking, oh, but Kaylee's got it. He's got the, he's got the buy. Like, he doesn't need to do anything. And then that was the first time he, to me, he looked mortal, was in that 2011 race in Daegu when he dropped out. Not saying the same thing's going to happen here, but just a historical parallel I thought of. Kipchoge has made a decision. He's going to run Berlin, the Berlin Marathon, 78 mm-hmm. days away. Kipchoge choosing Berlin. He loves. Is Berlin, London, back and forth. It goes round and round. Berlin, London, Berlin, London. Hey, did Tokyo last year. And Tokyo. Okay, so I think the Kipchoge running Berlin would okay. We he's done it many times. There's really no like interesting analysis on what will Kipchoge do at the Berlin Marathon. He's gonna win it. That's what he's gonna do. Cool. All right, but my question is, he has said. He wants to run all of the majors. He still needs to do New York and Boston. 
Does him yep. announcing that he's going to run the Berlin Marathon on September 25th screw up or make you ponder his marathon schedule strategy at all? Yeah, it pushes things back, obviously, because you have a perfect opportunity to run New York right now. And then you could go Boston in the spring. Maybe he wants to line those up in the same year. It's not, it doesn't put it outside the realm of possibility, but it, it delays it. And even someone as good as Kipchoge, nothing is guaranteed. So, yeah, I think it certainly impacts it. Do you think he can run New York this year? In Berlin? Yeah. Marathons I don't think so. Yes, they have for sure, but he's not that type of marathoner. He's really selective with his racing. Has he ever done two marathons? Or sorry, has he ever done three in a year before? I just think he has his pattern that he sticks to. Shout out to yeah, Colt so right now. We're looking at yeah, him once, yeah, always one or two. Throw, throw this up, Colt. This is good content for the for the people to, to see. Yeah, put this up also on the on the big screen here so everybody can see what you're doing. Colt's going year by year, back checking. So we don't have it yet. Um, yeah, if, you only have to go back a, a few more years. 15. Scroll down there to marathon two in 2015. 14, 14 two. Two. And then 13, 13 was the first two. year he. Yep. Yeah. And then well, he, that was. But the he hasn't run a marathon year. yet this year. So he could still do his two. Hold on. Go to this year, Colt. Tokyo wasn't this year? No. I'm losing oh, yeah, track. It was. Yeah, it was. Oh, goodness. Time, bro. That was March, oh, man. That was. That was... <laughs> Take it back. You're right. You're right. We literally yeah. did a live pod during that. We did. Well, I don't know. Yeah. I think this is. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to project what he's doing because we know he's doing London. I'm, we know he's doing Paris. So, okay. I think he does. Well, we know oh, yeah. I Berlin forgot about now. that. Yeah, yeah so this pushes New York back by two years, probably. No, I think. Or sorry. It's going to happen. He's going to do 23 is. and then 24. Okay. Now, now my yeah, year. So he's going to do. Sorry. He's going to do 2023 Boston. I think he's going to do 2023 Boston. Then he does 2023 New York. Yeah. Okay. And then he and does settled. 2024 London. And then 2024 Paris ends at Paris. So that's probably what he's doing. This is probably okay. his last Berlin. And that's, that makes sense. When you, when I hear you say that, I think, man, that's somebody who has a ton of confidence in their longevity and their consistency. And then I also think if there's one person on planet earth who should be confident in anything that they do in their longevity and consistency, it's Ilya Kipchoge in a marathon. He, he is uh, pretty much a singular figure in that respect. So I don't know if he deserves any, any doubt whether or not he could pull this off. But to me, pushing it off another season just opens the door for a possible hiccup. But again, he's never had that. Save for one London Marathon, one time. That's it. But yeah, that allows him to have a one a farewell race in Berlin and a farewell race in London, the, an Olympic race, and then you check off New York and Boston. The reason I I want to I want to see New York and Boston, like New York especially, I want to see him go for that course record. Boston would be tough if the weather isn't great because we all know. Tailwinds that day certainly helped the athletes. But I, I want to see him when he's still at his best try to put up a historic mark on those courses because those times really mean something. Yeah. I, mean, I don't think he needs to do anything. He doesn't, does, whether or not he has the, uh, a different course record or the here or there is not going to change. His legacy is already done. Like no, it's already it's, been no, printed I just out. See it's it. already etched. Everyone just constantly is like, oh, yeah, we got to add an amendment. He, uh, in 2023, he jogged this course. In 2024, jogged this course. He won them all. And no. no. Good. <sighs> I just want to see him run it as 
Iliad Kipchoge. I don't want to see him run it later in his career when he's not, you know, in world record or world record adjacent shape. Because I, I love, I like those races, and I, I just want to see what a runner of his caliber can do on that course. Again, the race could be tactical because there's not rabbits. The weather could be bad, but I just, I want to just entertain that possibility at least. And at the end of the day, his main priority is winning them so he can win them all. So I, I was a bit surprised, to be honest, that he did. He chose Berlin. Sticking with the marathon, London Marathon field announced. Uh, you can watch this race live on Flowtrack for mm -hmm. subscribers in U.S. Bekele. All right. Is Bekele, what's Bekele doing here? Let's figure it out. He's well, he's entered in the meet, but he's running Bekele, a London Marathon. Is he running it or is he DNSing it slash DNFing <laughs> it? Gonna what is he gonna do? Is are we getting a real Bekele I, marathon or is this once again another rope a dope where like we get excited about Bekele plus twenty six point two miles, and then we're always it always ends with a disappointment except for that one time in twenty nineteen. But like, what do you think? Yeah, what the, what's a Bekele marathon field? at? <clears throat> Well, I think a Bekele Marathon right now is somewhere in between or around what he did last year, which he started both Berlin and New York, got third in Berlin, 206, and then got sixth in New York, 212.52. That's where he's at right now if he's, if he's running. That's him getting to the start line. So I don't expect him to contend for the win. Mo Farah being in there in a bit of a similar position, although I'm a bit more optimistic on Farah's chances. He's pivoted fully away from the track. Because remember last year after he missed the Olympic team, he said, hey, I want to wear the British jersey one more time. And I think people interpret that as, oh, he's going to go for the 10,000 in the Commonwealth Games or Euros. It's all, it seems, pointing now to the marathon. So these guys are the biggest names in it, but they're not the favorites. You have Lemma, who's a defending champion. You have Legese and Garamu, who've run under 203. You have Amos Kiprotu, who's run. 203.13. Bashir Abdi is a mid-203 guy. Tola and Atana are also sub-204 guys. The, the winner is going to come from that group, most likely. Farah and Bekele are just the big-name guys in the tail end of their careers running a big-name race. Do you think this is Farah's final competitive race of his career? I think it could be. I think it absolutely could be. Maybe he does, if it goes well, he takes another shot at a marathon. Maybe, maybe he really does want to wear the British kit again, so he wants to run World Championships marathon in 2023. But it just it feels like he wants to go out on top. We talked about this before, but that gets harder and harder to do, and then success keeps getting redefined and redefined and before you know it you've been going you know four or five years since you were your prime and you're ready to compete with the best in the world so this could this could be it very well yes no and he had a great career good. he had an awesome career oh, really and if he, he retires had, Sarah had a great career if, if i'm gonna say it i'm not exactly a lot of people did he do? <laughs> 10 golds but i'm saying that's People it? always say the end, the end can turn. No one remembers Jordan on the Wizards. I'm sorry. They don't. They don't. If you, if you typed in Michael Jordan last shot in YouTube, you'd get the Jazz game, the shot over Brian Russell. That's what you'd get. Uh, we're, um, right? Last shot. Hmm. Yeah, you're right. Thank it's you. It's all yes. – yeah, the images are of him and, Jordan, and yeah. LeBron. I mean, not him and uh, Chicago. That's yeah. funny. Do you know how it's many shots he took on. after that with the Wizards? A lot. No, but no one even knows. How many years did he play with the Wizards? Do you know? Isn't it three? You don't know. You don't know. That's my point. You don't know because that part of his career wasn't important. He came back. It was awesome. It was exciting. But that's not what, what people remember with Jordan's career. People, Farrah can run forever. What people are going to remember is his run from starting in 2011 through 2017 that's what they're that's what they're going to remember so none of this tarnishes his legacy 
Does it benefit it? No, just because the bar was so high for him to match. But yeah, we're at a couple of years now. 2020 was, you know, that year obviously was in- interrupted. He uh, didn't finish that London race, but he ran some good races. That's when he ran that hour run on the track. He ran a 60 minute half marathon, but 21 and 22, he's been he's been pretty f- far off. So I just think. This could be the end, so if you're a Farah fan, appreciate it. Speaking of the end, are we near the end of OTC? Or is there a new beginning? Or is there something else brewing? Because um, it was just announced that Mark Rowland, formerly of Oregon Track Club Elite, been there for a yeah. long time, is now joining the Athletics Canada team Mm -hmm. yeah what's your thoughts on this move from in the the northwest with mark roland now with athletics canada i think for a while now it's been clear that they're probably winding down otc elite heard some rumors of that the past couple years i just think in years past if Cooper Tier and Cole Hawker go pro and they stay in Eugene, they run for OTC Elite. That's obviously not happening. Now, what's looming in the background here is the vacancy for the Oregon track or for the Oregon coaching job, right? Which obviously could influence it because it's not just about coaching the university team. That person has just a lot of sway over running in Eugene as a whole. They're not naming the OTC elite coach, but that could be that could be a factor just in how track town as a whole is is positioned. But yeah, I think I think the club is going to be winding down. It's it's a shame because especially with so many meets taking place at Hayward, for them to have that that distinct jersey and that connection to the Eugene community was something that separated them from the other teams on the track, but I'd be surprised if they hire another high level coach and continue the program. Do you think there might be some like, you think Bowerman is going to stay Bowerman? Do you think there could be a situation where they kind of. Yeah, I think move... Bowerman's staying Bowerman. No. So, I think Bowerman's staying Bowerman. I just you you look at the roster over the last couple of years with OTC Elite, and it's clearly trending in one direction, right? Yeah. I mean, again, th- this used to be all right. You for sure you get that best Oregon miler who's coming out, or the best Oregon eight hundred meter runner, or the best couple, and then it's just not, it's just not um, the case anymore. I mean, how many on the roster? What do they, what do they have? Eight, eight or so people. At this point, how many made the team? Uh, Eleven, I guess. Uh-huh. Well, you got them. You got them representing a bunch of different countries, though, as well, too. Yeah. So, again, well, and then you got a bunch of different event groups, right? Because you got Sally Kipiego in a marathon. You have eight hundred meter runners out there as well, too. Um, yeah, it would be great. Again, I, I'm a fan of clubs. I think it's interesting. It makes it. Just having a different jersey on the start line from everybody else. If they just end up running just generically for Nike, I wouldn't like it. But I interpret this as they're winding it down. So if they're winding it down, do you, do you think uh, – I don't know. Because hear me out here. You put a galaxy brain. What if they're not winding it down? What if mm. – Jerry Schumacher Buckle your seatbelt. is looking to move towards the coaching job at Oregon. And then there's a vacancy for all these uh, for all these pro athletes at Bowerman who now need a coach because he's now at Oregon. And then they all get kind of emerged into this OTC brand. And now we just have a yeah. big switching of, you know, it's like the whole OKC, New Orleans, uh, Charlotte Hornets situation, you know, where the 
teams are moving around in different cities in the NBA. Just could just be just you know you have Union Athletics Club, which is new. That used to be NOP. Yeah. You know now there's no NOP. There could there be you know just a lot of interchanging things. It's all Nike just kind of just resetting the field. All right, we want our coach, the Nike primary coach, to be at Oregon because that's Award Field. And then you have our two yeah. secondary teams with OTC and Eugene. And then Portland would be Union Athletics Club with Julian. I don't know. There could be some big shape, well, shake up coming. And maybe this is just the first time. Sure. Sure. But I don't know. Again, I don't know if those things are going to be linked. They could. They could not be. I just, I just look at the roster. Um, and you look at the coach leaving and you're like, all right, where is Nike going to invest their money moving forward? And, the, you know, and they, they have existing contracts there with people that they're, they're going to see through, but, and that could last, that could end up lasting longer than OTC. Here's what I'm saying. So what you're talking about could happen where it's like, all right, this person's under contract for another couple of years, but then that just requires a different coaching arrangement. And pretty much everybody on here is a veteran, right? For the most part, so or been around at least a couple of years. I guess there's a couple of new faces, but just are they going to want to change coaches and groups? And I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I, if you're saying, hey, they're going to do a bigger reshuffling around groups, wouldn't surprise me. Although they just started Union, like with a branding, so that would be weird for them to change that right now. Yeah, but you know, uh, weird things happen. Nike is prone to do some crazy things out there. So, so Tampa Eagle says is OTC Pete Julian? No, Oregon Track Club. It's Oregon Track Club elite's Mark Rowland. Union Athletics Club is Pete Julian. Oregon Track Club elite is in Eugene. Union Athletics is in Portland. Oregon Track Club elite was. Ashton Eaton back in the day. It was Nick Simmons. It was Andrew Weeding. They had just ran Tyson Eaton. They had a bunch of athletes that spanned different event groups that made it interesting. And I think it just sort of continued that Oregon tie. Oh, I watched this person in college and now they're running pro and and they're in that familiar OTC kit with the with the tree like i'm gonna cheer for them or that or, or the simmons it's part of the reason why simmons everybody thought simmons went to oregon was because he was wearing the otc jersey for all those years but you look at the roster now that's listed on their site blankenship green amos kipiego mead hayward piccarello sutherland paulson sietti stanisfec only sutherland went to went to oregon in that group what if they know Ben Thomas isn't going to get the head coaching job at Oregon. Ben Thomas moves over to coach OTC. Cooper Tier and Cole Hawker now are part the key, you know, big two of the new OTC. And then that's what they're planning on doing. What if this is a move for Ben Thomas to slide into OTC? A lot of his former athletes are already on OTC, the Virginia Tech kids, right, who came yeah. in and run OTC. So if Ben Thomas takes over, Hawker, Cooper Tier, they're there. They're going to keep that, you know, that team relevant because they're going to make multiple teams throughout the next five or so years. And then it goes back to being a good hub for Oregon because now that Oregon connection is a lot more stronger because their top two guys are yeah guys. Well, and, and that's, that's a important. recruiting advantage too because all these kids coming up into college, they're probably looking up to Tier and Hawker. Oh, how do I get there? Okay, well, you come to Oregon. Look at this pipeline we got created. You come here, you win a national title. You could run pro here in, in Eugene. You could join Hawker and Tears group. Yeah, but if you're Nike, like, what's the difference between a group just being – like having a group and then just sponsoring runners financially? I mean, I guess one is more expensive than the other, right? <laughs> it's easier just to go you gotta individual. got to make jerseys. Or, right, Got to make more yeah. jerseys. Look at our website. Yeah, pay for the monthly plan. Well, right. The WordPress website. Yeah. Well, 
you have the youth like it's an actual club right it's a whole club so there's a youth element to it they put on clinics they do all this stuff for the like Oregon track club isn't going to go away it's just what what the elite group looks like but yeah they have masters they have youth they have this whole infrastructure here i don't think that's to be clear i don't think that's going away i think it's just the elite component uh would shift but i just wonder yeah how do you how do you decide which group to keep and which group to cut because if you're going to sponsor the athletes anyway i guess the coaching part of it would be because you if you have a club you have to have a coach whereas if you don't you just okay go find a coach on your own figure it out but. all right we got a couple more things to get to let's move on you want to talk about the Ulamar Rojas long jump being <laughs> excluded? I freaked out when I first saw this. I read this as triple jump and that she wouldn't be allowed to compete in the triple jump. So her shoe, the stack height was too high. She used triple jump shoes in a long jump competition. And thus her long jump mark that she used to qualify for Eugene's is void. So she can't jump in long jump, which is bad but the catastrophic scenario would have been if she somehow for whatever reason had illegal triple jump shoes and then she wasn't in the triple jump when do you find this out it feels like super late to understand like oh by the way this is yeah. not doesn't count it seems super re- weird late time game decision i don't know it's like wouldn't you know this <laughs> was it a mistake on rojas part like does she know that she was never going to qualify because this mark was always going yeah. to be invalidated. Like, it seems kind of weird that it, it's not known till now. And also, I agree. My goodness, shoes. Shoes always finding a way to make things <laughs> crazy. That's a headline for you. Put that one on YouTube. Shoes find a way to make things crazy. Five millimeters, too thick. What five those millimeters? Those numbers were publicized. Oh, yeah, uh-huh. those numbers were were well publicized. But the fact that she is a triple jumper, it makes it understandable that you wouldn't remember to switch the shoes out or change the shoes. I don't know. Again, I was just freaking out that she wasn't going to be in the triple jump. So I breathe, I breathe a sigh of relief when I saw it was just a long jump. So that's where my focus went, as opposed to saying, "Wow, this is." crazy that she's not in a long jump because of this but shoes find a way jordan shoes will find a way i just thought we were done with this whole shoe debate but finds a way to just keep on creeping in every year this time in the yeah. triple jump and long jump anything else on this topic any, any no. other shoe takes just that it's stupid yeah, that's my take on pretty much everything in our sport. A lot of times, this is stupid. Why are we doing this? It's oh, it's stupid. A guy runs nineteen sixty three, but now he can't compete at Worlds because he needs to do a transfer of allegiance from Cuba to Portugal. And if you run at Cuba for Cuba, then all of a sudden you have to take two years off to run for Portugal. Well, maybe why is this a thing? Why is your citizenship a big factor for deciding who the best runner is in the world? Makes no sense. You think Wimbledon has that oh, problem? See- you think Wimbledon's like, uh-oh, you are changing countries, so you got to sit out Wimbledon for two years. No, they're like, if you're a top-ranked tennis player, you play tennis. Stupid. Did you see Andrew Hudson's out, by the way, speaking of transfer of allegiance? Oh, no. Or Jamaica? From U.S. to yeah. Jamaica? Yeah. Yeah. Makes sense. But then Stupid, though. wouldn't that be known? wouldn't that be known before – he competes at the championships, right? Well, they probably know, but they're probably like, I got to start, you got to start running for Jamaica eventually. You might as well run at the national championship and then get your feet wet until you actually are eligible. And I get it. The yeah. national ch- allegiance is a thing because, you know, certain countries like Bahrain, 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 Bahrain are just like paying Kenyan athletes to be, they're star runners, and that's kind of a yeah. weird thing. We don't want that. But at the same time, I think the bigger problem is why is your nationality a key indicator on your chances of going to a world championship? It makes no sense. Like, we should just be inviting the 48 best runners in the world 
And I get it. They're like, ooh, but what about the smaller countries? It's a great moment for the national pride. Yeah, that's what the Olympics are for. Have that national pride at the Olympics. But the other three years, let's get the top 48 runners, the top 48 jumpers. Who cares if 12 mm-hmm. of them are from Jamaica or mm-hmm. 15 of them are from Kenya or like, and four of them are from, you know, Great Britain. It doesn't matter. I want to watch the best of the best. Yeah. So. Should track move to the Big Ten? Yes. I think that, <laughs> that's going to be fun. Oh, by the way, we haven't talked about that. That's going to be interesting. USC, now at the Big Ten Outdoor Championships. I'm sure they're like. Bring oh, a jacket. Crap. Bring a jacket. Get me cold. Yeah. USC trying to run cross country. Ooh, good luck. <laughs> That'd be fun. So, um, yeah. There was rumors, like though, with USC and UCLA moving to the Big Ten that Big 12 might add Arizona, Arizona State, Utah, Colorado. If Colorado. Mm-hmm. And they Oregon used to be in the Big, Big 12. 10. Colorado is originally yeah. a Big 12 team. Yeah, Big 12. But if all of a sudden the Big 12 is Oklahoma State, Colorado, and BYU, and Iowa State, that's a hell of a cross-country conference. Well, we're moving towards two mega conferences. That's where we're going. So all these little we're pieces three. in the interim. All these little pieces in the interim will be nice two or three year stories. Oh, this conference is, but eventually, it's, okay, these two, three power conferences are going to be crazy. The thing is, though, all this is done with football in mind. They're not thinking yeah. about other sports, cross country sports. But the yeah. net, yeah, but the net result could be, you know, really drastic for for different smaller sports in terms of how conferences are broken up. Because we talked about it with the Big Twelve adding BYU. And, and Houston, it's like, all right, you got a really good sprint school in Houston. You got a really good distance school in BYU. You add those into the mix. But by the time they eventually move, everything's going to be changing again. It just it feels like you're looking at a house that's under construction or a neighborhood that's under construction. It's just every moment you look up, it's, it's changing. But, um, and all this, the concerns about the Olympic sports traveling, I think, are legit. But in track and cross country, they – compete so infrequently and they comp- they not, they're not doing yeah. they're not doing duels right so they're going to yeah. these bigger meets so that's not going to impact them as much um i do think it's interesting though we went from will college sports survive in 2020 to yeah the volleyball team can play and can fly to uh new jersey on a wednesday and then they can play in state college on a saturday and then fly back to la what's wrong with that we got that TV money. It's all there. Yeah. For the record, right. I don't like it. I don't like it. I just want to be on record as saying I don't like it. For the record, well, I don't give a shit. Well, because you went to Johns Hopkins. No. So you don't you don't have a connection to I always... You don't li- you hold on though. Hold on. I think you do. You you don't now they're gonna play eventually again, but was it ten years that Texas didn't play Texas AM? Like you thought that was good? Yeah, you didn't care? no, that's true. Do you know what I want, though, to happen? I want the Ivy League to add Johns Hopkins <laughs> and Stanford and have 10 teams. Okay, so now you and do care. Then I can say I'm an Ivy League grad. That's oh, okay, saying. that's why. Very selfish. Colt, uh, you're, a, you're a Big 12 guy. Your thoughts on conference realignment? Uh, I mean, I'm kind of just worried that, like, I, like my school, Kansas State is just gonna get left behind eventually, which yeah. I, I, like I just honestly like no one cares about Kansas or Kansas State, um, mm-hmm. and if there's a big super conference move, eventually we're just not gonna be part of the group that moves to the new super conference. So what happens then? I guess is like the the thought at the end of it. But for now, I guess it's fun. But. You can join the I just MAC think, conference, MAC in action. Yeah. Playing football on Tuesday just, afternoons. It's just dumb, though, because you shouldn't have to be – you're not – everybody's cheering for TV deals. It's like, this is sports. I don't expect it to be a level playing field all the time, but you, 
you can't cut out the K-States of the world. Also, change is inevitable, all that other stuff, but you're really undercutting the one thing that made college sports unique with the rivalries and the traditions. <laughs> <laughs> 12 heats of the 10K yeah. at the Stanford Invite. Yeah, that's what – no. Yeah. But the rivalry, that's what separates it. Because what do you yeah. get if you have if you have two 16 team power conferences? So you have 32 teams, a full full fledged playoff, but very loose connections between any of the teams. Now it's okay, it's awesome. Ohio State's gonna play uh, USC. All right, that's great. But haven't you just created the the football G League at that point? You've created an inferior product to the NFL with a playoff. And there's no tradition. You have bands, I guess. You have that's what you have. It's also a pro. See... It's also a pro league at this point. I mean, with NIL, like the bigger yeah. schools, that's yeah. it's a separate division almost. Yeah. I, I just thought of something. What if so Oregon track coach still waiting to fill that position, right? We don't know who it's gonna who it's gonna be. Be because of this conference realignment happening, there have been rumors that Oregon is going to move mm-hmm. conferences, right? That Pac-12 may not survive, right? It's crazy to see USC and UCLA at the Big Ten because it's like, what the hell? Yeah. What if Oregon found a way to get invited to the SEC? Yeah, And then if that That's were to right. happen, and if we were to know, like if we were to know right now that Oregon was in the SEC in 2024, that Oregon coaching job all of a sudden will look very differently to Dennis Shaver, to Mike Holloway, to Chris Bucknam, mm-hmm. to all these SEC coaches who now will be like, oh, okay. I can still be in the SEC conference, but now I'm going to have the Oregon. I'm going to be the home of track and all that stuff, plus SEC, Mm -hmm. because I think it's kind of hard for an SEC coach to want to leave the SEC for, you know, uh, a job. I mean, we did see uh, Coach Flo leave the SEC for Texas, but now he's going back into it. You know, Texas still has that national brand. But do you think if, if, we, yeah. if we were to find out tomorrow that Oregon was going to join the SEC, would there be a current SEC head coach in track and field that all of a sudden would be like, I want that job? That would want it? I mean, because having still a, relocating. a head coaching job in the SEC is like, that's the best place to be for track. Yeah. But you're still relocating to the complete opposite corner of the country. And I yeah. think even if you're in the SEC, I just – did Oregon have problems recruiting before on track that the being in the SEC would solve? They don't rec- – they didn't recruit like – their male sprinters weren't anywhere near the level of the male Hold sprinters on. in Kai SEC. Williams. Hold on. It's one. Hold on. They had one. Okay, no – Oregon isn't they, running out a 302 4 by 4 every year the way every SEC school does. Okay, yes. The depth may not be the same, but they've had some guys there. Yeah, they have I don't individuals, think it would... but they don't have the depth the way SEC track has. But, here's, but what does Oregon want? I don't think it's what would the SEC coaches would want. I think it's how would it change Oregon's pursuit of a head coach. Would they, would they want somebody different? I think if Oregon were to become an SEC school, they would put all of their money that they have, all that Nike money, would go into Mike Holloway, 100%. See, but see, I, I think, though, what would be the best way for them to win in the SEC? Would it be going, getting a 302 4x4, or would it just be cleaning up in the distance events? No, I mean... Because they'd be, they'd have a massive. I mean, Arkansas obviously has been been really good. Ole Miss, yeah, and Ole Miss, inside, yeah. blah blah blah. Right, we, we we know all that. But like, just in terms of weather and infrastructure and stuff, they'd have a huge advantage on 
other teams just to clean up on the distance side of things. Yeah, but you don't win conference titles on distance. It's hard. Even when Ole Miss was at its peak of like literally getting putting like three. You to win five national guys titles on distance though. In the top eight. You can win national, national titles, titles on distance, way. but you can't really win conference titles on distance alone. It is very hard. You have to like Well you could Yeah. I just you can't. It's not that common. So Maybe do um, both. I think that would be an Maybe interesting you... wrinkle where conference realignment would affect track and field is if SEC became – if Oregon became an SEC school, then all of yeah. a sudden we might see a bigger change of the guard. Because you know. mm-hmm. right now when you look at potential Oregon coaches, you're looking more distance-based. You're looking more non-SEC school-type coaches. You know, But if they became SEC, then all of a sudden – chaos yeah all right i gotta guess my pr for you ready all right by the way checking on the chat uh thomas says don't worry colt ku basketball will land somewhere important that's true colt's a kansas state fan yeah are they gonna move in tandem is that the agreement do they have a pack (laughs) absolutely not we would abandon kansas in an instant if we had the chance vice versa i assume okay so that doesn't help all right here we go gordon Yes, my PR. This is from Riley. Workout number one. And we got some photos that we're going to, we can show as well too. You're going to guess his 5K and 3200 PR. Workout number one, 10 by 1K at 325 with half rest. So I'm guessing half of what he ran, he rested. So 10 times 1K at 325. Workout number two. Eight times 400, progressing from 70 to 62 with 400-meter jogging rest. So eight by 400, progressing from 70 to 62, 400-meter jog rest. Now, I also have his mile PR, too. I could give that to you. Or for bonus points, you could try to guess that as well. Do you want the mile PR or not? What am I trying? What's the other PR I'm trying to guess? If I'm not You're guessing his mind. 5K and 3,200. Okay, and he did 30. Okay. I'll read it again. 10 times 1K at 325. 8 times 400 from 70 down to 62. Yeah, um, so that's light, light green, green shorts, shorts right there. Front. Okay. Yeah. So he, he, learned, he runs in the front. So he's... In, he's uh, He's a tactician. He doesn't sit in the back <laughs> of that front pack. He kind of sits on the shoulder of the leader. Right. Yeah. So he, he's got some strategy. It's five so that day. 325 is, well, okay, so 330 is, is that 1730 pace? Yeah, so 325 five, is 1705 pace. Yeah, 1705 pace for 10 by AK. They did. That Again, I can time. give you – I'm offering you the mile PR because he gave his mile PR if you want. Yeah, give me the mile PR. I'm going to go all mile in on PR. just trying to get the 5K right. All right. Well, you got to get the 3,200 right as well. Mile PR 441. I shouldn't have taken that lifeline. <laughs> I regret that. Help? I regret that lifeline. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. So, All right. Um, 440. 1705 pace for 10,000 meters. Broken up. Let's. What is a 440 times 330? 440 times 1428. So if you run his PR three times, he would run a 1428. So somewhere between 1428, 1705. Survey says we're going with. Let's give him a 1659. 1659. 1659. And then 3200? 3200. Um, give him a, a 940. You are very optimistic <laughs> with Riley. No, wait, PR. No, wait, hold on, hold on, wait, wait. Okay. That's, I'm changing my mind. I'm changing my mind. I'm going 
17.30, and I'm going 10 flat. 17.30 and 10 flat. Yeah. All right. 17.51 and 10.31. <laughs> I'm going to give you zero points on this. Yeah, I know. Because <laughs> you use the lifeline. Well, here's the thing. We haven't done Guess My PR in a long time, right? It's been Four, what, almost 441, a month. 4.41, though. 441 to 10 flat is, I mean, I guess that's possible if you're more on the distance side of things, but that's tough. I'm, I'm not on my game. I'll be honest. This is a bad, I guess my PR performance for me. I'm going to adjust accordingly and I'll be, I'll be back and better after Worlds. That's why I was waiting for my post Worlds to, to get back in the guess my PR shape. So I'm not in good shape right now. But I do have um, one question to ask the commentator commenters the live chat we're going to post this as an individual clip so you can also comment on the youtube clip below got a question so you see behind me you want to zoom we can we can see you can this see. is my whiteboard it says flow track podcasts in non flow track colors very simple graphic i just wrote it didn't know what to put here but I have a blank whiteboard and it's, I need to change it. I need to change what's behind me. And I'm thinking I want to put up a picture of something, but I thought it'd be, I couldn't think of it. I could, I can think of things to put up here, but I thought it'd be more fun if we let you decide. So comment in the chat, comment below. What should I put behind me on the, for the podcast moving forward? It could be a picture. It could be a quote. It could be anything, probably track and field related, because we're track and field podcasts. As much <laughs> as I try to turn it into an NBA podcast, every few podcasts, we're track and field podcasts. But what should I put behind me? My, one, my first big thought, I'll just give one right away, was the meme of Sha'Carri Richardson with Shelly and Fraser Price looking behind her after the Prefontaine Classic last year. Thought about putting that picture up here because everyone has very classic, very visual understanding of, uh, I don't know, of my take on Sha'Carri. I'm a big Sha'Carri fan, even though she's not a big fan of me, but whatever. Uh, but yeah, what should, I put, what should I put back here? So comment. Is it live chat saying anything? Do you have any ideas? Can you look at the live chat for me, Kevin? Uh, I will look at the live chat. Uh, David says a picture of Kevin. Picture of Kevin. Oh, that's that's a good one. That's it's definitely a top five. Did he say that or did that's you meta. just is you make no, up this? He person? said it. Okay. He said, uh, Thomas said, Yes, we've been looking at your generic whiteboard for months now. I, yes, I got a I picture a of a swamp behind me and then a TV, so I can't really uh complain. How about a picture of you you dunking? That or we, some all time great dunkers. Or just me Photoshop dunking? Because I'm not dunking yet. That's, that's a work in progress. Well, As you know, I, I fell on my box jump this week. So. <laughs> <laughs> I got Colt, a giant you're a, gash Colt, on you're my an artistic shin, guy. Yeah. What do you think, Colt? What should he do? Ooh, uh, I think the Photoshop of the dunking is definitely top of the list for me right now. Um, yeah. Maybe that photo of you cooking a pizza from earlier on in the oh, photo yes. days. Yes. Maybe, yeah, maybe you running, like the, the video of you running. We should just have that on like a loop, like a like an NFT. Like, you know how they have those people that have like the, the framed GIFs? You should get a GIF of you yeah. like pulling the pizza out of the oven for sure. <laughs> That's a good idea. All right. So, I mean, These are good. doesn't this be one idea? There could be multiple comments that have great ideas, and then I just rotate through it, you know? Cause yeah. Nothing's permanent. You could do a collage so, back there. Something. Do a collage? Yeah. Several several pictures. That are up if there. you make it too small, you I... won't be able to see. If you make the images too small, it has to be big, right? So you only can put yeah. like two to That's four true. things back there. Okay. I the reason I like the whiteboard, you never used it this way, but I liked it when you would write random stuff up there, like whatever yeah. idea you came up with that day that pretty much everybody else hated, and then you just write it yeah. up there, or predictions, what have you. But it also doesn't need to just be the whiteboard because look at all this other white space, right? You get up here, put stuff yeah, here. You take the, can, yeah, you take the whiteboard put off. Stuff here. How about a mural? 
Let's make it permanent. Let's yeah, paint it up there. Mural? What is your land? A painting? You don't own your house, but I'm sure the person who does own your house would be fine with that, right? Yeah. It would be known as it'll, – it'll go down as like, oh, that's the Flow Track podcast corner. Like 50 years from now, it was like there was this podcast. Yeah. This guy named Gordon, he used to live here. Mm -hmm. Had horrible takes, but we want to memorialize him with keeping his artistic vision in yeah. the room. Uh, yeah, so Thomas yeah, comments, says, ideas, and I'm going to might put them up. I'm going to pick one. I'm going to change it. So Thomas says Photoshop of Gordon outleading Nick Simmons. David says a how-to thermostat manual. <laughs> I like that. That's, think about sunscreen. Be, I, I could use it because I could just look at it and be like, oh, because the thermostat yeah, yeah. is right around the corner. So it'd be useful. Okay, what do I do? Oh, check, check my studio. That tells me. What maybe, maybe you could collect, I don't know, from worlds, you could collect something, some artifacts, okay. and you, you know, put that together. I don't know what that would be. Should I steal the could world championship a, medals? And just put a bunch of yeah. <laughs> those world medals. The banner? <laughs> Some signage or something at the end? Ooh, no, signage. I don't know. Oregon 22 signage. Yeah. I, that, that's notorious at track meets. You know, whenever you go to a, a college meet, there's always the kids who steal the NCA logo and then they put it up in their track house. Like this. Yeah. For the record, for anybody listening, we're not – this is a – for the record, this is a joke. For anybody listening and affiliated with, with, with the, the meet, this is a joke. We're not actually going to do that. So. But they're not going to um, need the banners after the meet. So maybe I could – I know what you could ask. I know a guy. Ask. I know a guy. Yes. Ask he might hook us up. A guy that you know. Wild yeah. duck, maybe. Yeah, was... Get something from there. I don't know. I think I'm going to try to get an Oregon sign. That would be fun. The Oregon 22, not University of Oregon, but Oregon World Championship logo. That would be fun. All right. We'll figure it out. Yeah. But comment, and I'm going to take your suggestions and figure this out. So appreciate it. All right. Thanks, guys. The email address. Podcast at gmail.com. We'll be back Monday. We're going to do a two-part preview show Monday, Wednesday. We'll probably keep it the same as last time. We'll probably do men one day, women the other. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks to Colt for producing. Have a good weekend, and we will talk to you on Monday. World Champions.